to talk to you about today uh, is in the context of social entrepreneurship. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about how this whole TerraCycle came to be uh, and what we've done with it. Uh, uh, and then also and uh, talk... Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. It's fine. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about garbage, uh, what is garbage, and, that, uh, and the defining theory around our business, which is all about waste, uh, and talk to you a little bit about how this all came to be, and then ideally take some questions and chat about what you may be interested in. But before I do that, I wanted to give you a little context into what this is all about, so you have a little understanding of TerraCycle. So we have this little video I prepared uh, that I'll play for you first. Do we have audio? Yeah. Are you sure? Are you sure you have audio? No, just give me a second. Okay, try it again. Ah, really yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry. I'll try it one more time. But I dropped out of school eight years ago because I just fell in love with the concept of garbage. Our major global solution for garbage is put it in a pot or burn it. These are not sophisticated solutions. And that's how TerraCycle came to be. Can you guys hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 By making things that are non recyclable and recyclable. Can a plastic bag technically be recycled? 100%. Can a candy wrapper? 100%. We do it. We're the biggest collector and processor of wrappers, chip bags, and other flexible packaging in the world. But you need a unique system because on its own, the economics don't work. you sorry for the uh, level of uh, sound, but hopefully you've heard that. Uh, hopefully it gives you a little context into what this is all about. Now, I think one of the unique things about social entrepreneurship, unlike normal business, you know, if you went to um, any business school, and I lecture at business schools all the time, and you ask the audience, well, what's the purpose of business? The answer is going to be profit, return money to the shareholders. That is the purpose of business as defined in a normal context. What's unique about social entrepreneurship is that is not the purpose. The purpose is what do you do for the environment, what do you do for society, and make sure you stay profitable so that you can survive and, and live. And when you look at it in that context, I think it's really important to take a step back and understand what is it that, you're, that your business, your social business, is looking to solve. For us, it's the question of garbage. So it's important to understand where does that come from? How does garbage come to be? And when you look at that question, it's, you know, the first thing is garbage is not a natural idea. No animal except humans have the concept of garbage. Uh, the output of one system, say if uh, you know, uh, a leaf falls off a tree, 
is very important for the next system, the microorganisms that eat that, and the plant that will grow from that, and so on. So why does garbage exist? As you sort of saw from the video, I would argue it's a very, very modern idea, maybe no more than 80 years old as a concept. And it comes from two things that add together. The first is the one to the most right, is that our objects today are made from very complicated materials. My shoes are made from plastic. You know, the, what you're sitting on right now is probably some form of plastic uh, textile with foam inside, which is also made from plastic. Everything is made from these very complicated materials. Then you add on to that that we consume at a crazy rate. And this is not just an American issue, this is a completely global issue. If you look at a person today, one of us, and you compare us to someone alive 100 years ago, so that's only our grandparents or our great-grandparents, today people buy 10 times more stuff than we did 100 years ago. And 100 years ago we had to buy food to eat, we had to buy clothing to stay warm, we had to have a house to live in. Which means the extra 9x of consumption that, uh, that we now buy is all stuff that we buy to make ourselves feel good. You know, fashionable clothing, you know, more toys, whatever it may be. 9x complete increase in consumption. Then you add on the fact that the human population in the same time has grown by 7x. You have almost 100 times more stuff being bought by the human species than you did 100 years ago. Those two things together create the very concept of waste. That's it. Now, I mean, all the negatives out of the way first. Garbage is a very big problem. It's five billion tons a year is the total problem. Now, even today, 25% of the garbage ends up in oceans. Still today, 25% of the total amount of garbage ends up in oceans. Now, you've, anyone heard about the Pacific Garbage Giant? Is that a you guys are aware? Anyone been there? Can you raise your hand if you've been there? Okay, I've been there a few times. I just want to describe it to you. It does not look like these photos. These photos, that's a bird who was probably on a beach and ate plastic that washed up on a beach, or that's a river in Rio, uh, in Brazil. The garbage gyre, uh, there's five of them, not just one. Each ocean gyre is a big garbage patch. It's about the size of Western Europe times five. There's five of them. Each is about 10 meters deep. And it doesn't look like this because the plastic has degraded into such small pieces, it looks like normal ocean. Except if you take a cup and you look at it, it's a little milky. It, it's not perfectly clear, which is even worse than this because animals can avoid some, not always, but easier to avoid this than it is to avoid just something you can't even see. So that's 25% of where the garbage goes in the world today. So where does the other 75% go? Of the 75%, 5% globally is recycled, which leaves 70%. The rest, 70%, is either burned or buried. It depends on the country. In North America, in Latin America, in uh, uh, any developing market, it's almost all buried. In countries like Japan, South Korea, Germany, 70% of your garbage is burned. You know, one of the big, big misconceptions here in Germany is many people think that when you put a piece of garbage in the yellow bin, that it's recycled. 98% of the garbage you put in that bin simply is burned. So, if you, it's an insane thing. Did you guys know that, by the way? Is that, a, yeah. Look into it, it's pretty, pretty scary. So, the question though is, what is the answer to this? And I just want to say the answer is not TerraCycle, it's not companies like mine. The answer is the, the, the thing no one ever wants to talk about, which is how we buy. That is the reason garbage exists. Because remember, when you buy something, you are voting for more of that object to be created. A friend of mine runs a very big organic uh, iced tea company called Honest Tea. I don't think it exists here in Germany, but it's a very big company uh, uh, in the US. And he just sold his company to Coca-Cola a year ago. And he was telling me, we were out at dinner uh, uh, two weeks ago, and he was saying, well, you know, wh what's going on with now that you're bought by Coke? And he said something interesting happened this year, uh, for this quarter for Coca-Cola. I don't know if this statistic is America or if it's worldwide, but in Q1, uh, Coca-Cola saw the biggest decrease of sugary beverage purchasing uh, in its history, uh, which is like a can of Coke. The only thing that went up for Coca-Cola uh, in Q1 was the natural beverages, or like the VO beverages. And what does Coca-Cola think then? They're not out there thinking about how they convince you to buy more sugary beverage. They're now thinking, how do they buy into more <clears throat> organic or, and, or healthy products? And that's exactly how you transition anything, is by purchasing better. So if you don't want the idea of garbage to exist, this is the four steps. You first have to look at buying consciously. 
So instead of, uh, and that doesn't mean understanding every detail of the product because that's very hard. That's a lot of work. But just understand that everything you buy one day will end up in the garbage. At least, as long as you're aware of that, maybe you'll buy a little differently. Then the next step is instead of buying disposable, buy durable. So instead of just buying a disposable pen that you're going to throw out, you know, when it runs out of ink, maybe buy a really nice, beautiful pen, and then maybe the girl sitting beside you will be even more impressed than you than you know than uh, than now. Now, if you are willing to buy durable, maybe then you can consider buying used, because anything durable will be available used on eBay or whatever service exists here. And the very best thing to do, by far, is the very top. You just don't buy anything at all. That is the fundamental answer. It's not what we do. Now, that's all the negative. So I want to get into a little bit of the story of how TerraCycle came to be. Um, I started the company in my first year of university. I'm actually from Europe originally. I was born in Hungary, then lived in Dusseldorf, then in Holland, then uh, Canada, and then I went to school in the United States for university. So I get down to, uh, uh, to the US, and um, my friends in Canada, uh, before I left for university, we decided to start growing some plants in our basement. This is the plant over there. It's, you know, it's the plants you've got to put you know, in a very special basement environment and, and so on. <laughs> and it's very difficult to make these plants work well. You know, first, you're, you're, you know, what do guys know about gardening, right? And it's complicated, they're very delicate, and the weird thing about these plants is that if you don't take care of them properly, they turn from female to male, and then there's no point uh, to have them. <laughs> so, what happened is I come down to school, and my friend Pete, who's here, who took over gardening, he's, he called me in the middle of my first year, and he goes, Tom, finally, the plants are working really well. You've got to come up. So I get in my car, I drive up to Montreal, and I walk into the room, now filled with these plants, and it was amazing, it was a really great night, you can tell by the, the photo. And, uh, but I asked him, how did you get the plant to work? What happened? And he said, well, I took organic waste, stuff that looks like this, fed it to worms, and what the worms uh, pooped out, or worm poop, was what he fed the plants, and it worked incredibly well. Now, this is not something we invented. Gardeners have been doing this for a long time. It's basically how nature creates fertilizer anyway. But I was interested in the business behind this, you know? Garbage is something we pay to get rid of. That is another way to look at uh, garbage, you know? You guys are in uh, uh, a school here, many of you know, you know, supply and demand curves, right? If you're doing any sort of business, uh, sort of economics, you always draw supply and demand curves. And what's really interesting about the, uh, let's see if I have a picture on this, I don't, uh, on supply and demand is that you notice that when, may I draw something here? Okay. So if you have a supply and demand curve, it always looks like this. You have zero here, this goes up, and this goes up. And basically, you get two lines, uh, and wherever they cross, the supply and demand is the price, right? But where would garbage fall on this map, right? It couldn't, because this implies everything has a positive price. Because it's sort of crazy to imagine a potato farmer paying you to take his potatoes. Or it'd be very weird to think about going to a university and the university paying you to come and take the service of learning, right? It's very unusual. Garbage ends up falling here. If the supply and demand of dirty diapers would look like this. Because there's lots of supply, but there is negative demand. In other words, we pay to get rid of it. That's another way to look at garbage. If we weren't willing to pay to get rid of it, it's not garbage at all. So anyway, I went back to school, and I was really inspired in this idea of starting a company focused around taking organic garbage and feeding it to worms and making a fertilizer. And I checked you know, online, no one had done this in a big business way, so I thought, okay, I'll be the first, and we're gonna make a big worm poop business. I went to the university and convinced them to give me lots of this, and then my friend and I developed this machine. Now the idea for this machine uh, came to me while I was sitting on a toilet, because if you think about it, what's the purpose of a toilet, right? Toilets, especially in certain countries like in Tokyo, you know, they're beautiful, they have all sorts of buttons, they blow air up your butt water, and you, you know, do all this really neat stuff. But the only reason you sit on a toilet is to move your feces and your urine away from you as fast as possible. That's why it exists. There's no other reason to do it. And what it speaks to is that no animal likes hanging out in their own waste. Because we're built as animals to avoid our waste, so that some other animal will go eat it. That's how it all works. Now the problem in the human system is that we avoid all of our waste, but there's no other animal that is, can eat plastic cell phones, or can eat laptops, or can eat shoes, 
right? Only natural materials can do that. So the way the system worked, it's basically a toilet for worms. First, the, uh, the organic waste would go into this system here, which rotated and cooked it very quickly. And then the cooked food would go down to the middle and then split out onto the, the conveyor belts. These are all one by one meter conveyor belts. And the idea was that worms are going to move towards the middle out of their poop into food, while the conveyor belt would move in the other direction at the, at the same speed, which was about one centimeter every three hours. That's how fast this moves. It could be on, you just won't even notice it. And then worm poop fell off. And it worked. It was crazy. And, uh, but the challenge was, you know, we had invented the machine, we were processing 500 kilos of organic waste every day. This was in a, uh, I was at Princeton at the time, this was in, a, in a, uh, an area of the campus that the university let me do this in. <laughs> but nobody, we, you know, we wanted to raise money to build the business, nobody would invest whatsoever. We couldn't raise money, it was very difficult, because they said, you know, you're 22, why don't you start a .com, a website, that's what young people do, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, it, you know, it, it made it very difficult. Now the way we ended up raising money is we ended up going around, and universities all over the world host these uh, things called business plan contests, where you can uh, go in, enter your business, uh, you present it, and then you can raise some money. And we did this, we entered seven, we uh, uh, won most of them, and we uh, raised about $100,000. And we were able to develop a little bit further. We figured out even how to liquefy the worm poop to make it into a liquid fertilizer. We had this very big turning point happen in April 2003, so about now, a little bit more than 10 years ago. We had $500 in our bank, and we had one more big business plan contest uh, to enter, which was for a million dollars of financing. We entered the contest, to make a long story short, we won. But the problem was that the investor uh, who was giving the million dollars said, hey, we love the idea of an organic fertilizer, but why complicate it by making it out of garbage and making a very complicated supply chain? And they said, forget the whole worm poop thing, let's just make an organic fertilizer, put it in Walmart, and, and boom. And, and there's logic to that. But in, in the concept of being a social entrepreneur, the point to me wasn't fertilizer. That was not the focus. The focus was a solution to garbage. So we said no to the money. And we felt very you know, good about ourselves, but also very poor at the same time. <laughs> so we go back to our university room. And uh, my friends and I were sitting down. We're deciding what to do. And uh, we thought, well, look, if we created a product out of garbage, maybe temporarily we should package it in garbage. So my friends and I thought that was a you know, great idea. We throw out packaging all the time. So we took some plastic bags and we went around to all the recycling containers in the Princeton area. Now it turns out, going through people's garbage is not legal. And uh, I had a chance <laughs> to reflect on this while spending a night in jail that night. Um, but the next morning, when I finally got out and went back to the office, there was all these bottles that the people had uh, collected. And what was fascinating was one of the first realizations about garbage. We've had many, I'll show them to you, but one of the first ones was garbage is very standardized. In the world of bottles, like soda bottles, there's only four types of bottles. There's the half liter, the 591 milliliter, which is the 20 ounce bottle, the one liter, and the two liter. And that's it. There are a few exceptions, but that only makes up half a percent of all the bottles that exist. So 99.5% are the same. Now within a half liter bottle, there's no difference between a Coke bottle or a Pepsi bottle. The only difference really is the shape of the bottle. So if you look at uh, uh, how our first product began, it looked like this, and you can see that a, a Coke or Pepsi bottle would be no different. The same height, the same tread, the same bottom, and then we were able to invent this as our first product, which is every aspect of this product is garbage. It's a used soda bottle filled with liquid worm poop. The trigger head is left over from large companies when they change their designs. The only, actually, the only part that is new, to be fair, is the label, because the label uh, had to fit different shaped bottles. One was a Coke bottle, one would be a Pepsi bottle. And even to this day, we do this through high-speed bottling lines now. You can take used bottles and run them at a very fast rate in a production line, and it works. No one's ever replicated this before. What was, you know, so we got very excited about this. Uh, it was a whole new thing for us, and so we decided that we want to sell to the biggest retailer. Instead of start small, let's go to the very biggest retailer and see if they can list it. In the U.S., that's Walmart. And we decided you know, to start calling the person who buys fertilizer at Walmart. Now, the problem is they wouldn't take our phone calls. So we did this thing where you know, one of the ways to be successful in business is just to be persistent. And so we would take five different phone numbers, cell phones from friends, and we'd call from different phones, so it wasn't the same phone number always you know, on the guy's phone. 
And we called every hour, and we did that for 23 days, and on the 23rd day, <laughs> he picked up. And he said, it must be you who's been you know, calling me so much, please come down and let's get this meeting done so you stop calling. <laughs> and we went down, and uh, we were able to sell the product, and he ordered 100,000 bottles of worm poop in a soda bottle. The problem was, it was my friend and I in, in university, and we had no factory, we had nothing, we just had this idea, and he didn't know that. So, we get this order, and we have to deliver this in 90 days. So, this was one of those moments where you have to jump in the swimming pool, as they say, and, and uh, we had my, uh, a bunch of friends going out collecting bottles, but we partnered now with a recycling center, so it was okay. Then we had some friends with a razor blade cutting off the labels, someone pouring in the juice, and then the, way, the hardest part, honestly, was putting on the, uh, the shrink uh, sleeve label. Uh, so what we did is we took four hair dryers, put them like this in a cone, and you dip the bottle, and it would all shrink, and <coughs> out it went. And uh, we ended up getting the order done one day early, and the money from that order allowed us to uh, look at a, a, a nearby town, uh, which was Trenton, and we bought this building, look the way it looks in this photo, and uh, within a few years it ended up looking like this, a completely green building with solar panels and all sorts of really fun things. Actually, even in that process, what was really neat uh, was we discovered a metaphor for waste. You know, graffiti is, a, is, is something that we pay to get rid of all the time. Imagine if I took a can of spray paint and I spray painted a beautiful piece of art in my mind here. <laughs> the university would probably be very upset with me uh, and uh, the university would probably spend money painting the wall back to whatever this color is, this sort of white color. So they would pay to get rid of it. So what we did instead is we've told, uh, in, and now we're in 26 countries, uh, even here in uh, Germany we have offices in Berlin, but every office around the world we have a rule where anyone can come paint any wall whenever they like. Here's what it looks like in the U.S. And it's so big, this, this thing, uh, and the U.S. office, just to give you perspective, is about 5,000 square meters for, uh, for a sense of scale. The walls, every outside wall, every seven days is brand new. So when you come in Monday to the office, you come into a whole new building. Now, another realization of waste was the intellectual property of rights of waste, the legal right of garbage. Whoever knew garbage has rights. And what was interesting is we discovered this when we started selling this product uh, in major retail. And after Walmart ordered it, then everyone did. That's what, you know, when you get one big player, they all do. So then Home Depot, Target, all the other big U.S. retailers started carrying the product. Within months, we got phone calls from the lawyers at Pepsi and the lawyers at Coca-Cola. And they said, guys, you're breaching our trademark. Our shape is our property, even if it's not containing a, uh, a beverage. Uh, uh, it, we own the shape. So we ended up having to do a lot of work with these lawyers and now we have the only license in the world from Coke and Pepsi to package shit in their distinctive shape. <laughs> so. But our legal troubles didn't end there. You know, TerraCycle in the first year we did 70,000 in, in, in sales, then half a million, then 1.5 million, then 3.3 million. It was growing nicely. But every time we got sales, someone else would get off the shelf, because there's only so much space in a store. And the person that kept getting off the shelf was this company, miracle Grow. Now it's important uh, uh, that, that you, you know, know the difference. This is TerraCycle here, and this here is miracle Grow. Again, just in case you cannot tell, that's the work poop in a soda bottle, and that's miracle Grow. And I say this because what happened is four years later, uh, four years you know, from the beginning, miracle Grow sued us, saying, you cannot tell them apart. Again, just in case. <laughs> that's TerraCycle, that's miracle Grow. Now, one of the problems in the American legal system that is not as big a problem in the more worldwide legal systems is that if a company as big as miracle Grow, which is like $3 billion, sues, even if we were going to win, which we would have won, it was costing us $250,000 a month to fight this legal battle. That much. It would have been $3 million to win. That's what the lawyer said. You will win, but only $3 million later. And the problem is that even if you win, you don't get your money back. You know, in, uh, I'm not sure about German law, but I know that in most countries, if, if I sue you and you win, I pay your legal bill and my legal bill. And that's how it should be. Again, I'm not 100% on Germany. I know UK is like that, Canada is like that, Australia, and so on. And so we had a very big problem here. But this is one of the areas where the power of social business comes out. You don't have to fight a battle on the, on the playing field that you're put into. We thought, well, we'll you know, do the legal thing, but let's instead fight this question in the media. So we put a big press release out saying you know, that we were being sued by this company, and the media 
are always going to support social business. And they came in and there was a hundred articles written within 60 days saying, why is this big chemical giant suing uh, TerraCycle? And I can't disclose the terms of the settlement because we ended up settling, but within 60 days they let the lawsuit go. Because there was so much media pressure on them that they, it wasn't worth continuing that battle. So I want to now step back a little bit away from the story, back into garbage, or the theory of garbage. So we talked about all the negatives. Now let's look at garbage positively. Every object one day becomes garbage. No exception. Everything one day will end up as garbage. The only difference between you know, this lectern and uh, my iPhone is this will probably become garbage as soon as the new iPhone comes out. And this will you know, be garbage maybe in 10 years. That's the only difference is time. Now when things become garbage, th some things are recycled and everything else is not recycled. So what's the difference between the, you know, something like this, which would become garbage, or something like this, which you can put in the recycling? I can tell you both technically can be recycled. The difference, and the reason some things are recyclable and some things are not, is entirely to do not with technical capacity, but with economics. This is the magical equation of recycling. The reason an aluminum can is recyclable uh, anywhere in the world, and at very high percentages here in Germany, I think over 90% of the aluminum is recovered, is because the cost of collecting it and the cost of processing it is less than the value you get. So it makes sense to be in the business of recycling aluminum. But for example, we recycle cigarettes in nine countries, and actually are launching our German cigarette recycling program in a few weeks. To collect cigarettes and to process them is way more expensive than the value of cigarette plastic. And that's the same for you know, boxing gloves, toothbrushes, pens, and everything else. So as we started growing as a business, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we were four years in, we had a big turning point. You know, we had one, basically you know, had a, uh, a really good outcome on the lawsuit with miracle Grow. We were now three and a half million dollars in fertilizer business, and we asked ourselves, what was the purpose so far? Are we a fertilizer company, or are we a company that's looking to bring solutions to garbage? And we said, no, of course, we're a company looking to bring solutions to garbage. So the question became, can we make more products out of garbage? Is there a way to not just make it fertilizer, but to make it almost anything uh, that you can imagine? So we constructed a theory. We first said that garbage is made from three things, or three, three concepts. Let's just take this glass here. This is first glass, all right? It's the material. But it's not just glass pellets in my hand, it looks like a cup. So it's composition and features. So it's the glass to look like a cup. But it's a third thing too, it's an idea. The idea of this is something that I can drink with. This wasn't made to hold um, you know, flowers or pencils. It could, but it was made to hold a beverage. That's why it exists. And if you agree that garbage is made from those three things, composition, features, and intention, you unlock the magic of circular solutions for garbage. Now there's five possible things to do with garbage. The very worst, and I think we all agree, is put it into a big pile, put it into the landfill. That's really bad. The next best, which is what happens here to about 70% of your garbage, is it's burned for energy. That is better than throwing it out, but the, uh, putting it into a landfill, but what it, where it's similar is that you, in both cases, uh, can only do that once. You can only burn something once, or you can only landfill something once. You can't do it twice, three times, four times. It's not circular. In circular solutions, there are three possible circular solutions. Reuse, upcycling, and recycling. This is reuse. Uh, reuse is where you value the material, the features, and the intention of the product. We do that a lot with cell phones, uh, laptops, digital cameras, clothing shoes, and so on. But here's non-typical examples of reuse. Well, of course, this is reuse, right? The reusing the bottle. But this is how that range expanded. For example, this here is the number one best-selling bird feeder in North America for two years, and it's just an upside-down two-liter soda bottle. Or here's something that's maybe atypical. We did this at Walmart last year. We took 35, we found that a margarine package, or a butter package, is exactly the same specification as what you buy plants in. You know, if you grow plants, you may have bought plants in those black pots that you have to throw out, was the exact same spec specification, so we collected 35 million used butter packages, put a hole in the bottom so the water can get through, and this is how all the plants in Walmart, California were packaged. I mean, this, everything I'm showing you, by the way, is in big numbers, okay, so that's reuse. 
But reuse is limited to about 1% of the waste that we produce, because not everything can be reused. So the next quest one was upcycling. Upcycling is where you value the material something is made from and its, uh, sorry, and its function, but you don't value its intention. For example, Capri Sun pouches were never intended to be a backpack, but they make a good backpack. And everything I'm going to show you, by the way, is in big volume all around the world. Okay? Um, pet packaging was never intended to be pet products. Wine corks, never intended to be cork boards. Circuit boards, vinyl records, mailbags. Uh, uh, these are things like uh, speakers or um, you know little uh, lunch boxes, shower curtains made from granola wrappers, uh, speakers made from M and M packaging, uh, stationary products from coffee bags, pens from toothbrushes, uh, bags from movie film, you know, soft, or sorry, footballs uh, from juice pouches or even shoes. Now, <laughs> it's impossible to become an expert at everything. So we changed completely our manufacturing process. We used to have 200 workers doing the work group. We, we closed down the factories and we did everything through outsourcing and licensing. So the way we make our products is sort of like how you see it here. This is Timberland, which you may know is a shoe company. The bottom of the shoe is replaced with wine corks, sort of like what a Birkenstock uh, sli uh, sandal looks like. You just can't see it because of the white plastic that's around. And then 30% of the le leather has been removed and substituted with coffee bags in this case. But it's five layers of coffee bags squeezed together to create enough strength to be able to hold a, a thread. So that's how it's all done these days. Now upcycling can go well beyond products. Uh, it can be really fun. These are dresses that are both in museums that we made. One is made from, uh, this is 6,000 used M&M packages. And well, let's say that the raw material, getting the raw material for that dress was uh, a lot of uh, hard and maybe fun, fun work. <laughs> Even our offices all around the world now have a rule where every detail must be made from garbage. This is our headquarters in the United States where every detail, everything, is garbage. Um, or this is what it looks like. It, our office in Germany used to be in Mainz. It just moved to Berlin. This is uh, the office uh, in uh, Mainz. But you can see here these doors, or these um, tables are old doors. Everything is garbage. Or Toronto, or Sao Paulo, or London, and so on. Now, the challenge with upcycling is that not everyone wants to have a Starbucks shoe or a Capri Sun backpack. It's very limited to about 4% of the waste we collect. So then you get into recycling, which is here recycling things that were never recycled before, but recycling is defined as you value the material something is made from, the composition only. So you may know this toy. This is a Hasbro Mr. Potato Head, but he's a special version because this one is made entirely from used potato chip bags. We found that everything can be recycled. I mean, today uh, uh, we recycle used chewing gum in our division in Brazil. We recycle used cigarettes in nine countries and soon in two weeks starting in Germany. We recycle dirty diapers. We're even launching a program later this year, believe it or not, for used femme hygiene products like tampons and pads. So if you can do that, trust me, you can <laughs> recycle just about anything. So something like Capri Sun, right, is something that when we talked to the company, they never thought there was an answer. And now, millions of pounds every month are either melted or extruded into different plastic products. But what we started thinking about is this started happening and we found that every type of waste can be converted. There's really no exception. Everything, it's just a question of money, can be turned into something else. So we, worked, we ended up working with a lot of great companies and the question was, well, can we have them start taking the garbage back into their own system? We found that's easiest on promotional situations. So for example, we do about 20 of these a year, but here's a playground where that playground is made entirely from used flip-flops. The only thing that was new was some color to get to that blue color. Or here are things that are completely closed loop. This is the first pen in the world made from used pens by the world's second biggest pen company. Or if you want to go very extreme, just one month ago, we developed five trucks. These are them right here where every plastic component, except for special thermodynamic components in the engine, but every non-thermodynamic component is now made from used potato chip bags. If you can do trucks, you can do just about anything. So hopefully I've shown you that you can solve the garbage. Right? And we found that, that that was absolutely no problem. Well, it's not no problem, but it's, it's, it's definitely possible. The question, though, isn't how to solve it. Why do we burn or bury our garbage? It's not because we want to burn or bury the garbage. 
It's because it's mixed together into a huge, complicated mess. Think about our closest relatives, if you believe in evolution, would be the chimpanzee, right? What garbage does a chimpanzee, what outputs does the chimpanzee have? It has three. One is what it exhales, the carbon dioxide, every time it breathes. That's one output. The second output is when it goes to the toilet. And the third output is, uh, 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 at the beginning, hair or skin that may fall off, and one day the body itself will die, and the body will become an output. Those are the three only outputs that a chimpanzee makes. Now, we do those three, too. We breathe, we go to the toilet, we also cut our nails, some of us cut our hair, and, and so on. But human beings, and we've evaluated this, have 300 extra categories of garbage. 300. And a category is as big as cosmetics. And even within cosmetics, the range is massive. Like lipstick and mascara are completely different how they're constructed. So 300 broad categories. And that's why everything is burned or buried, because it's so complicated. So the question wasn't solution. The question is how to collect waste in a separated way. That became the fundamental piece we had to answer. So the, what we did, uh, this was back about five years ago or six years ago now, we created our first model, which is what we call our brigade model. This works here in Germany. You can go to TerraCycle, I think it's .de. Um, and if you want to go to another country, we do this in 26 countries now, you can go to TerraCycle.eu and then from there you see the whole map and you can choose where you want to go. But you can go to the website now, you basically sign up for uh, whatever waste you'd like to collect. I think here in Germany we do oral care waste like toothbrushes and toothpaste tubes, um, uh, pens, uh, uh, and then a few other things as well. And you basically sign up for a program, you take a box, you fill it up with garbage, then you, when you're done, you download a free DHL shipping label, send it to our warehouse, which is in Stuttgart, and then when we get it, we check it in and we donate to you two cents for every piece of garbage you collected. Uh, you don't keep the money, you get to choose any school or any charity in Germany to give the money to. And this may sound like it's not really going to, you know, like it's small and interesting, but it's not going to be big. Here's what it looks like. This is, we're now, because we've been doing this in the U.S. for close to seven years, and 75% of all schools in Canada and the U.S., kids here collecting chip bags. Then it goes, it gets really interesting. Without us asking, hundreds of thousands of schools start developing these things, these monuments to recycling, but not one or two, but hundreds of thousands. And then teachers go a little completely crazy and dress like garbage, <laughs> teaching their students about recycling. Still, how big do these get? Here's an example, an average program. This is with L'Oreal to collect cosmetic waste. We do this now in Brazil, Canada, and the US. This is US data. Each bar show is how many pieces of garbage came in per month since we launched the program. Today, there are 3.5 million people collecting about a quarter million pieces of cosmetic waste every month, and it's only growing and growing. But the question is, is this good or is this bad? And so what we compare to is how the actual idea of recycling grew in a country. Take the UK, uh, there in 1996, uh, uh, they were at 6% of recycling of things that are recyclable, like there were no more uh, glass. 13 years later, they're at 23%, and we see that these programs grow about the same pace as the very concept of recycling, which became our benchmark. Now, one of the really interesting things, again, about garbage, I mentioned it's standardized. One of the reasons it's standardized is because it's the same company making the stuff everywhere in the world. If you brush your teeth in Japan, it's the same company that makes the same toothpaste and toothbrushes uh, here in uh, Germany. Colgate owns GABA, owns uh, most of the uh, German toothpaste market, just like they do in Japan, just like they do in Mexico. The beauty is that it's very standardized. And so once we were able to get one big company to join, this is maybe now 30% of our clients, but all these big, large companies trying to solve their non-recyclable waste through this platform. And we were able to do something special, which has become what I call a micro-multinational. Last year, in 2013, we did $20 million in business. $20 million is not a big number, yet we're able to operate in 26 countries, primarily because once we solved an issue in one country, the same company would call us and say, can you replicate it in other countries? So take Colgate. Colgate started working with us in the US. Then six months later, their team in Brazil calls and says, can we bring the program to Brazil? Great, OK, we'll go open in Brazil. Then can you bring it to Mexico? Then can you bring it to Argentina? Then Germany, then Austria, then Switzerland. And now Australia and New Zealand, they just replicated it in. It's one of the powerful things of working with major multinationals, especially as a social business, is the power of replication is really, really profound. You can do it very fast. But we also have learned that there's no one answer to any question. 
In the world of uh, collection, there's many ways that collection has to occur. Here's another model that now runs in 70,000 stores around the world. We make these special boxes, they get put into a store. Uh, for example, DM, which I think is a relatively big retailer here, in what, uh, like a month or two, Wolf? Um, two months? is going to be uh, uh, putting boxes like this into every DM in Germany to collect aerosol waste, like deodorant, you know, the spray deodorant uh, garbage. Um, or here's another one uh, that's pretty interesting. We just started developing this in Canada. In Canada, we sold 20% of our business to Canada's number one garbage company uh, called Progressive Waste, and we came up with this idea where now people in uh, uh, Vancouver can buy what we call zero waste bags. There are bags, and there's 50 types of bags, so you put different types of garbage in different bags, and what happens is this is what the garbage system looks like today in Vancouver. You basically have a, a bin where you put your food waste, which is composted. You have a recycling bin, like here the blue bin, where you get it recycled, but then everything else goes in what you have here is the gray bin or the yellow bin, and that ends up uh, in, in the U.S. as landfill. So now what happens is you can buy these zero waste bags, or get them for free, depending where we get the funding from, and you can put all your non-recyclable garbage in those, everything that is picked up by the garbage company, sent to us, and they separate out all the bags, and then we get a lot of separated garbage, which means it's the first time in modern history there's a home, or a, a, in this case a city, where any home has the choice of being completely zero waste, where everything from human hair to hygiene products to flexible food packaging is now recycled. It's just a question of money. So I want to leave you with one last thought. I talked a lot about how you know, our infrastructure works and how we got there you know, collecting waste and solving waste. But one of the very unique things about uh, social business especially is how you can do promotion. Usually marketing, you have to pay for it. And what makes for a good marketing executive is someone who comes up with very creative advertising and then another group of people who buy the ad space or the airtime very effectively. That's how you create good advertising, but it costs money. Our marketing department is not a cost center, it's a revenue generator. In other words, our we have negative cost marketing. And the thesis of negative cost marketing is why pay to be the advertising when you can get paid to be the content. So let me explain what I mean by this. The way to create negative cost marketing is a blend of a number of aspects. First, it starts with lots of publicity. Now, now we generate on average, I think, uh, it's a little out of date now, 18.3 articles every day. Actually, as I was driving here, I was doing an interview with a German newspaper of some kind. And the... Um, the way we do that is we say that this program is very valuable to our brand partners like Colgate or Bic or Capri Sun here in Germany and they fund us to generate publicity for them. So the publicity department becomes a negative cost publicity department and we're able to do campaigns like here in Germany there's been 195 articles written already today about Bic making its pens recyclable. And what happens is now you go to Google and Google something very generic like just chip bag recycling 98% of every link that Google has becomes this platform. Now, the question then is this, once you get a big media base, it allows you to enter into truly negative cost marketing. The first step in negative cost marketing is if newspapers write one or two stories, call them and say, could we start writing for you? Because one of the big issues in media today is there's more and more newspapers, more and more, sorry, more and more TV stations, more and more websites, there's more content to put out, but there's fewer journalists. A good example of this is, I remember 10 years ago when I used to be interviewed by big newspapers like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, as soon as the interview was over, an hour or two later, or maybe the next day, a fact checker would call me, making sure all the facts were correct. I haven't had a call like that in five years. The newspapers have fired all their fact checking departments because there isn't the money anymore. But there's more content that has to be put out. The Wall Street Journal didn't have blogs 10 years ago. New York Times didn't have blogs 10 years ago. But today, there's way more content and way less people. So they're looking for people to write. So today, we write for 35 major blogs around the world, like the New York Times, which pays us so that we can put in our propaganda. I mean, that's basically how it works. You just don't have to call a journalist. You just place whatever information you want. Then, if you're able to start blogging, the next step is you should you know, look at maybe writing books, giving talks, maybe getting into TV commercials maybe looking at doing uh, adverts, uh, uh, getting as many awards as possible, and every one of these things generate money while you generate awareness, all at the same time. And maybe the very biggest example of negative cost marketing 
is even having your own TV show. We actually have that. Um, we're now filming the second season of our TV show. It airs here in Germany as well. Season one was called Garbage Moguls. I don't know in German how that translates, but it airs on a channel here. And it followed, each episode of our TV show followed us as we solved the type of garbage. We're now filming our second season, which also will be airing here in Germany sometime in 2015. Uh, same idea, but a little bit more uh, comedic. And I had a big lesson uh, in this process, which is that if you are going to create negative cost marketing, usually in advertising, uh, advertising is built to serve the company. That's the number one goal, right? So it's all commercial and commercial. But in ne with negative cost marketing, it's flipped upside down. You have to first serve the content, and then you have to serve yourself. I'm going to play you a clip from both of these TV shows, and then I'll explain to you what I mean by what I just said. So I'm going to first play a clip from the first season when it was called Garbage Moguls. Finance department, this is Donna. I 
think if everybody cut out the stupid yoga and bring their dogs to work, we would be more productive. <laughs> Hi, International League team. How are you uh, having a scotch? So my dad's Al, I'm the general counsel here. It's 6 o'clock Friday night. I feel like I'm entitled. Al is like a bulldog. Bloated, self-righteous asshole. I mean, the guy's got a baseball bat in his office. And we have Andrew, who just it. lost his goatee. Yeah, you got like a whole baby thing going on now. I, I don't care about the environment so much. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> should have been like a They're always talking about the environment. And they're always talking about Barack Obama. Now we're going to have So we have Dean. Dean's our little skate. Anyway, give you a taste. Tune in in 2015. But the reason I want to show you the difference. Did you notice that in the first TV show series I showed you, no one left? In the second one, you guys were having a much better time. And this is the key to negative cost marketing, is that you have to first serve the content. Then you later serve your own propaganda. Because if you do it upside down, which is what we did in the first season, it won't be as interesting to people to watch. So the real balance of negative cost marketing is how do you blog for a newspaper here, and in the process of creating great articles, you're also promoting whatever you are interested in. And there's a special piece here in social business to do this. So, I'm going to leave you with one last thought, and then I'd love to take uh, some questions. We talked a little bit earlier about some of the more you know, unique types of waste, whether it's chewing gum or dirty diapers, but I want to touch on one specifically, which is cigarettes. The reason is that, you know, TerraCycle is a company that gets an award almost every 10 days for the social business uh, uh, work that we do. You know, uh, it's something that we really take our reputation extremely seriously. So why work with the biggest tobacco companies in the world? You know, we can all agree, whether you smoke or not, that you know, tobacco kills people. And what, why, why should a company like TerraCycle, should it not work with Philip Morris, BAT, RJ Reynolds, all these big tobacco companies? And this was a really interesting question for us. And we realized that you know, a lot of my friends in the social business space say, I'm not going to sell to Walmart because Walmart has problems with maybe you know, their, the way they treat their employees. Or I'm not going to work with L'Oreal because they do animal testing. Or I'm not going to work with cigarettes because they just kill people, right? These are all very valid points. But the big challenge that happens when social entrepreneurs do that is the business opportunity constricts to become very, very small. Because every company in the world has some problem on some side. What we decided to do was to say, we are not going to comment on whether cigarettes are good, or whether shampoo is good, or whether the food is good. Instead, we're only going to focus on the concept of waste. And here's what's happened. Within a year and a half of inventing cigarette recycling, it now functions all over the world. On the streets of Madrid, in Spain, or in Hungary now, people can recycle their cigarettes. Or if you're in Paris, you may see things like this. This is in Le Defense where people can now recycle their cigarettes. And it's even launching now here in Germany, paid for by a major German tobacco company. But what's really special, I think, about these sort of platforms, and when you create something that big companies are embracing, is when you get to change them. That, to me, is the most fun. So in cigarettes, it started a little bit, you know, sort of uh, normally. Uh, we had this idea called a butt sack, which is basically an aluminum uh, pouch. It looks like this. You put in your cigarettes, which this exists already, but the key difference is we print a shipping label on it, and you can put it in the post when you're done. And it comes to us and we recycle it. But here's the key. This was good, and we did a few million of these as promotional products uh, that they gave out at festivals, at uh, car races, or things like that. But then we came up with an idea. We told uh, uh, the tobacco industry, what if you changed your whole packaging? And you integrated this idea into your packaging. And what I'm happy to say is one of the world's biggest tobacco companies now is changing one billion packages per year to look like this. I can't tell you what the brand is, but I can explain how it's going to work. Basically, on the bottom of the cigarette package will be a hole. You put your cigarette back in the hole. Then that goes into an internal butt sack, which is inside the package. And then when you're done, you peel the label off, uh, which is like where the logo and the dying person is, and you peel that off, <laughs> and you flip it around to seal this part. And then when you're done, what's underneath? A shipping label. And you put it in the mail. And the mail becomes your garbage uh, bucket. And it creates a completely self-contained solution to be able to recycle everything in a very simple way. And that, to me, is the magic of social business. 
So with that said, thank you very much for your time, and hopefully you had a little perspective on how we try to eliminate the idea. Some countries do, but even in the countries that do, 
Biodegradable packaging is not something composting sites like. They hate it, in fact, because it's a contaminant to compost. It makes for really bad compost at the end. And a good example is this. In the United States, uh, Frito-Lay, which is owned by Pepsi, launched a product, uh, uh, changed, I don't know if you guys know the brand Sun Chips, but it's a chip brand. It's about you know half a billion dollar chip brand. And Frito-Lay, the owner of Sun Chips, moved away from uh, normal packaging to biodegradable, flexible packaging. Here was, and, and within a year, they decided to stop because it was too loud. It was like making too much noise. Now the joke was, I found out from the CEO of Pepsi, had nothing to do with what they thought, which is they thought that kids, when they shop with their parents, are playing with the bag and it's making their parents have headaches. It wasn't the real reason. The real reason was because people would go at three in the morning to their kitchen to snack, <laughs> and they were loud, and their wife or their husband found out, and they got in trouble. That was the reason they pulled the packaging. But here's the point. TerraCycle ended up with somewhere around half a million kilos of this material, because uh, we take all the factory waste from that company. And we couldn't find any composting facility in Canada or the US that would accept it, because they all view biodegradable plastic, like PLA, as a contaminant. They say, look, if it, if it comes in the waste, I have no choice. I have to take it, but I hate it. But if I can voluntarily choose to take it, they don't take it. That's the fundamental issue, is that it's, it's sort of too good to be true when you look at, oh, you throw it in nature and it goes away. It doesn't really work like that. You have this massive amount of energy that you invested in that product that you're now saying, forget, you know, you valuing that anymore. And there are no real systems that handle it anyway. Those are the two macro compounded issues. So the answer in plant-based plastic is durable plant-based plastic. Coca-Cola did this with the water bottle they have. I don't know if it's here in Germany, but I know it's very big in the Americas where they replace 30% of the plastic with durable plant-based plastic. And that, I think, is really good. Because then you're getting away from oil into plant-based, but you, you want to make sure that this material is refined and all that energy is valued. So it stays circling up there for as long as possible. That, I would say, I mean, we can go into more detail, but that's the summarized sort of biodegradable packaging challenge. But a lot of marketing people think it's just the golden answer, you know, and it solves every problem I have. But it really doesn't. And if you talk to the experts in this industry, that everyone understands it's a big misunderstanding. Anyway. Hi, uh, I'm Christoph and I'm here. Um, I was wondering, have you always been such a good presenter or have you done it <laughs> during your, um, yeah? You, I, you know, I think presenting. presenting, like anything else, is uh, you have to obviously care about what you're talking about, but it's practice. You know, it's, uh, if you watched me 10 years ago, I don't think you would, it'd be as uh, the same as today. And probably 10 years from now, you know, it'd be even better, I think. <laughs> but I think, you know, the trick to business in general, uh, you know, when, when we present our business, it's always about how we present. You know, it's not about a business plan, it's not about the proposal, those are important. But the real important thing is being able to capture the imagination of who you're talking to, because that's when they're going to buy your product, that's when they're going to come work for you, that's when they're going to come invest their money, or whatever you're asking. You're always asking something, you know. So I think it's something that you develop over time, um, but uh, in practice really, you know, makes you better every time. Yeah, in the back, way back. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, Tom, thanks again for being here and sharing your great story. I think it's really important that we talk on such a conference about social business in general. What we often lack is to see great success stories globally, and I'm, I'm sure you're one of the very few ones we can see out there. And it's impressive for most of us to see what you've, what kind of an impact you have within 10 years of building a business. Nevertheless, I'm interested in, on the sort of meta level if you talk about social businesses in general. So the question that most of us I'm interested in are probably something like, okay, what does it take for more people to become social entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. yeah? I don't know, do you have an opinion about that? And maybe you can share, um, if you go to the beginning of, of, of your um, um, business, if you're really honest, was it your intention to create a social impact, to create a social business, or was it more a general business opportunity that turned out to have such a positive impact? Yeah. And what does it take for others to become social? Business? No, it's a good good question. And, and to be absolutely honest, you know, when I started TerraCycle, it was more the second way you described it. You know, I thought it was a great business opportunity, and then I realized the power of social business when I realized it was also a social business. Um, so I fell into it. I wasn't my intention when I began. I wasn't you know, a social entrepreneur. I've become one uh, when I reflected on what I was doing. But I've learned that there is tremendous power in social entrepreneurship that normal business does not have. 
So what, you know, there, there are challenges, right, because you're looking at other bottom lines as well. You're caring about what is your environmental point of view, what is your social point of view, not just what is your economic point of view, which is usually all business is built to care about. But there is a lot of power. One of the biggest things that social uh, 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 business has that normal business doesn't is purpose. And the reason purpose is important is because when you look at, you know, your generation, I mean, we're in basically in the same generation, but when you look at young people and you look at the data, young people are now caring more about what their job is than just what it pays. And if that's a new trend. You know, 20, 30 years ago, what was important is how much you get paid. Today, people are thinking a lot more about what is it that, you know, I'm going to do. Because honestly, I think the function of our jobs isn't how much money we make. Our function of our jobs is what, biz what product do we create or what service do we provide. And I think people these days are becoming much, much more interested in that. And one way that manifests for TerraCycle is we have about 120 interns every summer who come in uh, and work for free. Mind you, thousands of people apply uh, uh, for these positions. And, it's, and, and that wouldn't be the case in a normal business where they'd come in and say, well, how much money am I going to make? Also, people are willing to work for less pay, typically, in a social enterprise than in a normal enterprise because you get paid with purpose uh, as well. Partners are willing to do you so many favors you wouldn't imagine. We have a business school doing a case study on us almost every month because people want to help out and come become involved. Companies make it much easier to partner with them. Uh, uh, reporters are much more interested in writing about these sort of topics. So you get a lot of these benefits that you wouldn't get in a normal business uh, environment. That's all the positives. The irony, I think, the challenge, and I'm sure you see this in your, in your work in the showcase, is that there's not that many. There aren't uh, uh, a lot of, you know, people talk about social business, but net-net, most of you still become bankers, right? <laughs> and that's the challenge, is that there's a lot of attention. There's a lot of opportunity. I don't have a competitor. I'd love for one of you guys to create a competitor, but no one does. Because it's sexy, it's vogue, but for some reason people don't make the jump. And what I can tell you, in running now a company, we have 120 employees, we're in 26 countries, we just did 20 million last year, this year maybe 25 or 30, we are a real business, is that it's very, very possible. I think when people look at social business, they are intrigued in it, but then think, oh, it's always going to be small, I'm always going to be like making granola and selling it in a local market, you know, to other hippies. <laughs> it doesn't, right? I mean, that is the point of view, and it's not necessarily how it has to be. So the, Big companies these days have created these CSR departments, social, cor corporate social responsibility departments. Every major company has it. And they're craving people coming to them with services. And I know all the CSR people and all these major consumer product companies from P&G all the way to Pfizer, and what they always tell me is there's no one knocking on our door. We have money we want to spend. We want to change. But there's no one coming to us with ideas. And that is the key opportunity. It's social business in its fundamental state is just as powerful as normal business. We just perceive it to be, you know, this hippie little granola thing that isn't, you know, isn't going to make any impact and will not make you money. You can fulfill the goal of capitalism in social business very well. And if you do that, you get so many other benefits that you can't get as a normal business. So I definitely recommend looking at it, but looking at it under the context of big business, not under the context of doing a little project or something. Uh, okay. Yes, in the way back. There must be companies who, who don't like what you do. There, I mean, they got a bit of walls against you or something. Um, yeah, are there sure. Any um, yeah. So uh, the biggest challenge, I'll tell, I'll give you a specific German one, right? So when we opened in Germany, what was the area that like first you know put its nose up was the Grunepunkt system, right? Here, brands have to pay into the Grunepunkt, which is that dot that is on every package a tax. It's, in Germany, collects about a billion euro a year in the, in the Grunepunkt tax. And uh, they viewed us sort of as a competitor, coming in and taking money uh, uh, to create recycling. Now, the problem in the Grunepunkt is that the Grunepunkt doesn't mean it's recycled. It just means you paid a tax. Still today, 70% of garbage in this country is incinerated. 30% is recycled. Now, Germany is still one of the best in the world. Aluminum recycling rates are higher than anywhere else, um, except maybe Brazil. Uh, uh, plastic soda bottles, water, uh, glass, paper, excellent, like really the best in the world, but everything else is still uh, 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 destroyed. So the way we've dealt with this type of situation is we decided, like every time we see that there's a theoretical risk or a real risk, is we try to partner with the risk. So in Germany, uh, the Grunepunkt system is administered by nine duala system companies. 
these are companies you can choose, there's nine of them, do you pay your Grunapunt fee into? So, uh, two years ago, we uh, sold 20% of, or 25%, actually 25.01%, the 01 is a weird, lawyers ask for it to be 0 0.01, but anyway, 25.01% of TerraCycle Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, to the third biggest garbage company here in Germany. And that allowed that risk to be turned from a risk to an incredible positive. Because now when we go into German brands, we're not just going in as, you know, a, a, a small, uh, environmentally friendly company, you know, with, uh, with a small staff here in Germany, but we're going in with a huge waste management company behind us. Or in Canada, same example, uh, Progressive Waste, which is Canada's number one garbage company, just bought 20% of TerraCycle Canada. We did the same in Brazil, where we sold 30% to the biggest recycling company there. And we're doing this in now in France, in Australia, even in the US. Because what I found is every time there is theoretical risk, and there is, it's, it's a very, you know, it does come up no matter what business you have, the first step is, is there a way to neutralize it by perhaps partnering with it? And then these companies have no incentive to uh, hurt us or compete with us. In fact, they're using their infrastructure to allow us to do some pretty incredible things, like that zero waste bag program I showed you, where you put the bag into, uh, uh, where was it, this one, this program where basically you put the, guard, like the bags into your recycling bin only works because the garbage company bought 20% of our business because we need their infrastructure to make this occur. And so that's been the best way that I've seen you know, to try to handle that situation. It's worked incredibly well. It's still why today there's no fundamental competition to what we do. Yes, in the middle. Black. All right, All right. Oh, my question would be, what is your vision for um, TerraCycle? Do you think the concept of TerraCycle is capable of solving humanity's garbage problem? I mean, my, so I think the best way for, like, the way I work with my team, the way to inspire, and our team is about the size of the audience here, that's how many employees we have. So what I try to put in front of a group like you to help us get to the outcome is to say, what is our end goal, right? What is the big end finish point? The finish is there's no such thing as garbage. But do I think TerraCycle is going to accomplish that? No. I mean, that's, uh, that, you know, that's a big idea that we are aiming towards. And the closer we get, the better. But I'm, you know, I'm a realist. I don't think we're going to get there in my lifetime because it's such a ridiculous problem. What I, the goal, TerraCycle's only grown for 10 years. But we're still this year, you know, maybe 25 million. That's still not a massive company. It's good, but it's not you know, billions yet. So our goal is to keep growing, keep opening in as many more countries as possible. Um, like, for example, we launched TerraCycle Japan in two months. We just opened our Tokyo office two, two months ago, and the official launch is in, uh, actually next month, in one month, in April uh, 20th. Um, but what we want to do is we want to continue growing our system, but to accelerate that, we're trying to do these waste management company partnerships, where in every country we want to sell a part of our business to a local waste management company. What's interesting with the garbage business is there's no global garbage company. They just don't exist. There's German garbage companies, like uh, Duala System Deutschland or Landbell. Then there are American garbage companies like Waste Management or Progressive. And then there's Australian garbage. You know, there, there's no global garbage company. There's not a PNG of garbage. It doesn't exist. So we want to try to then do these partnerships with these garbage companies that will accelerate the impact because we can start transforming the way they think. What's really exciting is when we first started talking with Progressive Waste, $3 billion garbage company in Canada, their vision for garbage is they said garbage is a problem. Our job is to move the problem from here to here. But that's, that's, the, that's what garbage companies do, and that's what their CEO, Joe, said. He said, that's our business. And what we were saying is, look, what way we want to look at garbage is that garbage is value, like nature sees it. And let's move it, you know, let's collect it, let's process it so it can come back again to the same purpose, and it does this, right? Like it does a circle instead of going from here to here. And what was amazing is, the guys at Progressive Waste said that makes a tremendous amount of sense. So they spent millions of dollars buying into us, and now they're changing big pieces of their business to echo this new point of view. And I think that is a way to accelerate the impact way faster than just TerraCycle trying to do it on its own. Because even if we grow at you know five million a year or ten million a year, you, you know ten years from now we're two hundred million, still small, right? And so. I hope, like in the next 30 year period, that we can grow as a business, but we can influence the whole way garbage is perceived and try to get closer to the answer. But we're not going to be the answer. Again, we can't be the answer. The answer is convincing people to make anti consumerism sexy. Here's the problem today 
you go to you know television, right, and go to MTV, uh, and what do people you know see? Like MTV cribs, right? What is that? Like a bunch of like celebrities showing off how many cars they have, how many houses they have, their private jet, and all their toys, right? And that's what we th uh, view as success today. You ask someone like, you know, what do you want to do? You want to make a lot of money. Why do you want to make a lot of money? So I have three houses, two cars, or five cars, and all this stuff, right? That's what we all aim towards. That is the problem. That has to change. Because if that doesn't change, we're fucked. Like, there's just no fundamental answer. No, it doesn't matter how many garbage systems are out there, it will not solve the issue. And so that's, and that's a challenge for everyone here. The only way to make that work is we have to change what is sexy to something that isn't based in buying things. You know, how many friends we have, um, how we, you know, like the conversations we have at night, the, uh, the, you know, the living in small houses, you know, making that, like the smaller the house, make that person the cool person, right? Not who has the biggest house, the cool person. That needs to flip, and that's in your hands, and our hands, you know, as uh, what, it, what creates culture. That's going to be the answer. So do I think TerraCycle will solve garbage? No. It'll just move, hopefully, closer and closer to that idea. Yeah, uh, hi. Go ahead. Um, my name is Yvonne, and um, as far as I get it, so your main business is in developed countries, so like US, Canada, Germany, Europe, and so on. So I was wondering what kind of activities um, you're doing in developing countries, which um, don't have a waste management at all. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. You can see, if you look at the map, the poorest countries we're in would be Hungary, uh, Spain, uh, Argentina. <laughs> I mean, I'm Hungarian first and foremost, so you know I can. But I mean, Spain. I mean, unemployment for people our age is almost 50% in Spain right now. Um, those would be the three uh, uh, poorest, and you can see everything else has more money. The reason is that solving non-recyclable waste needs money. The big joke, you know, I get invited, for example, by Procter & Gamble once a month to give a presentation to various business units to explain to them how they can think or design their way out of garbage. And I open with a joke. My, I, every time I do one of these talks, I always say this to the product engineers, wherever it is. If you want to make your razor blade recyclable, I have one easy answer. Make it out of solid gold. If you make it out of solid gold, no one will throw it in the garbage. 100% never will end up in the garbage. Now, of course, that's an extreme idea, but it speaks to the issue is that a razor blade is made with such unvalued materials that no one wants to collect it because there's no money in it. So the only way to solve the razor blade today, until one day it's solid gold, is to uh, get funding somewhere. And funding is easier where there's money, which is wealthy, large countries. So that's why we focused in that uh, path. Like our next country we're opening is Japan, very wealthy country. The next one after that is South Korea, very wealthy. Then China, then India. These are all big uh, markets. In Europe, we're in most of Western Europe, but the hard one for us is Eastern Europe. Poland, we will be opening next year, but opening in the smaller Eastern Europe countries, very, very difficult. And the reason it's difficult is two issues. One is money, access to money. Right? The, the contracts become smaller, the work you have to do becomes more, and it becomes just a much you work much harder for a much smaller apple, you know? But the other problem that I just totally don't understand is that the smaller the country, the more fucked up the legal system is. Here's, here's what I mean. In the US, you can incorporate a, co a company in one hour. Now that's the most fastest in the world, you know? But even here, I was with lawyers this morning here in Germany, uh, and it wasn't that bad. It was, we, we did some legal work and it was pretty quick. For example, in Hungary, uh, or Argentina, when, when I have to sign taxes for our company, you know, for all 26 countries every year, I have to sign off on the taxes. In the US, it's one signature. In Germany, it's three signatures. In Hungary, it's 45 signatures, six times copied, original. You know what I mean? And so what happens is the smaller the country gets, we saw this in like Israel, in Hungary, in uh, 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 Colombia, when we incorporated there, uh, the smaller the country, the more complicated the legal system is because it's somehow more in the past, you know? It's, it's not uh, made simple. So one of the lessons there is, you know, for small countries, they need to really simplify their process so it's easy for a company to come in and enter into a country. So it keeps us in a challenge. I don't have a good answer for you on what we do in these uh, in developing countries or uh, countries with some simply no garbage uh, system because there is no money to be able to do the work we want to do. Once you know we get bigger, we definitely want to be able to allocate funds to do special projects, but they're always going to be 
you know, like a nice special project. It's not going to be fundamental until there's money so that we can do the work we need. It's the same issue with all the garbage floating in the ocean. No one owns the ocean. It's going to cost trillions of dollars to clean it up, and no one's going to do it because there's no money to be able to access. No one owns it, and no one cares enough about it. And that's, that's just a fundamental challenge. Now, the only good news is that the poorer the country is, the less garbage there is, because garbage is a, is a luxury. You know, you can't afford a bag of chips, uh, uh, you know, like if you're really poor, you can't buy a bag of chips, but you may be able to get a potato or two, you know, so there at least there's less garbage. If you look at like Indian landfills, the percent of food in the, in the landfill is very high compared to if you looked at a landfill in Canada, because there's way more luxurious plastic that we get to throw out. So sorry, there's not a great answer there. It's just the nature of, you know, the way the world works today. Hi. Yes. Uh, I'm Tim. Um, thanks a lot for the, for the great talk, it was a, was a pleasure. Uh, one question I ask myself is, you talked a lot about um, corporate versus private, like yeah. you, you thought, okay, you can uh, work with a lot of big companies, um, which must be a big pain, it's like all these private people are uh, still throwing everything away, um, probably due to the big cost of logistics that you would, 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 that you would have. Um, so. My question is, is there a vision for you for, for a smart way to organize our ways, like to organize logistics? Like, I mean, you, yeah. you talked about the Grüner Punkt and you said, okay, hey, in theory, every plastic is recyclable. The problem is that just on a certain product, uh, there must be a certain waste. So could you like mark every plastic so you could choose yeah. that we would have 50 yeah. different Grüne Punkts to then allocate it to the different products? Well, that is the... And, and one last question regarding that. Would it be a problem if you would have a solution and then take all the plastic back, like use all the plastic? Would then the government be a problem because they don't, they would not be able to fill all the burning? Yeah. Meals? Well, that is a great. So, so let me answer both. Yeah, They're yeah, very so different. Not so, <laughs> yes. So one of the big areas we're focusing on is how do we get consumers to be interested in uh, doing this at home? It's one thing to do it at a school, at a dentist's office. I mean, we have, I think, close to now half a million people here in Germany doing this in Germany, but it's all at organizations, a church, a school, a university, you know, that sort of thing. And they can put boxes and it works, right? The problem is how do you do it at home where you have a lot of waste, range, but not enough volume in each range. And so that's where an idea like this is really what we're hoping to achieve. And we're already starting this in British Columbia. And we're soon going to be opening in Calgary, which is another big city in Canada, and Toronto, which is the biggest city in Canada, where basically what will happen is you get a catalog with 50 different bags. One bag is for, you know, say, uh, uh, um, uh, we call it human externalities, like hair, nails, you know, that sort of thing. So that's one bag. There's another bag for any flexible packaging. And there's another bag for... Um, say, hygiene products, and there's 50 categories. Now, if you don't want to separate into those 50 categories, you can spend a little more money and do what she's doing here, which is buy a bag just for kitchen waste. Because what we found is interesting about garbage, and I have this fascination, every time I'm in a room, I always look at what's in the garbage can, and I've learned something in this process, which is, go to a tennis court, and if you looked in the garbage, what do you think you'd see in the garbage, in a, in a, in a tennis court? Yes? Balls. Balls. What else? Sorry? Just speak up, I can't hear you. Huh? Okay, so you have tennis balls, the packaging for tennis balls, you know, the cans. You have energy bar wrappers and water bottles, and there's nothing else ever. I mean, nothing else always means 99% is that, 1% maybe random stuff, but it never changes, really. You go to an airport, what's in the garbage? Always what they sell inside the airport, because you can't take your food, at least in the, or many times you can't take your water through the security. Uh, so it's always what you can buy in the airport. You go to a movie theater, what's in the garbage? It's always the popcorn bucket and all of the packages for chocolates and things. It depends on, you know, what movie theater you go to, but it's always standardized. So if you look at a home, your food packaging is always going to be in your kitchen. Your, you know, the, the stuff you put in the garbage in your bathroom is always going to be different than the kitchen, but the same. In, uh, it's always going to be the same as bathroom waste or what you put outside. So there's six bags that are room separation. If you want to go really expensive, you can buy the no separation bag. But what happens is when, so the garbage becomes a bunch of these bags instead of uh, all the garbage mixed together. So, th so then these bags come to a recycling facility. What happens today at a recycling facility is they take all the stuff that's in like the yellow bin, they put it on the floor, then they have these bulldozers pick it up and put it onto a conveyor belt. 
on the conveyor belt, there's people picking off what, they, what is valuable. That's why typically what is put into a recycling container, 50% of it is thrown out at the recycling facility because it doesn't go past the picking line. So here what happens now is they pick out the bags. So we get trucks and trucks and trucks of these bags. Then we have a system where we separate all the bags into the, all the kitchen bags in one area, all the, you know, the human part bags in another area and so on. Then we open those bags and it goes through layers of separation. Now there's a trick to this where, take a kitchen waste bag. There's a hundred types of garbage that could be in there. Not 300, but a hundred. That's even better, we cut out 200. Now you have a hundred, so you send it through a line and you have 12 people. Each, or say 10 people, each person picks their, you know, uh, separates the bag into 10 categories. Now you have, uh, it just went through the line once and you have 10 categories. Then what you do is you take category A and you send it through the line again. Now you've broken that down into another 10 categories. You've got to do that basically twice and you have 100 separations. That's when everything in that bag can easily be recycled. But that still sounds like a huge cost of logistics. Like, could, like if you would work together with the companies, would it, wouldn't it be possible if you like, um, put a code on every single product you do, that you just scan it, you know exactly what yeah. product it is, what material that is, and then... No, look, you're right. So yeah. you've got to look at this in a few ways. What can you do today? This can happen today because products won't change today. And it's actually not as bad because the logistics, the transportation is in the normal garbage system. You just have hyper-separation, and it's actually not as bad as it sounds. It, it, it goes pretty quick. But then the next phase is to teach companies uh, how to make their products better. We're trying to do that, but that's very, very difficult. Yeah. And doing something like what you described would be great, but I would bet that it would be very difficult to implement a standardized code on everything, because it's just a huge task. So this works. Now, the other question you had was, uh, can you remind me just exactly, because it's really interesting. The, um, regarding like, if all the ways would go, Ah, yes, and this is this is why it's interesting. Um, first, forget it, 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 if the burning didn't exist, government should be very happy because it creates national security to not have to depend on other countries for your inbounds. You know, right now, this, how much oil does Germany produce? Do you produce oil? Yes, but a lot. I mean, are you oil uh, uh, dependent, right? Okay. Wouldn't it be better for the German, uh, you know, for any country, but take Germany to be oil independent? Right. The only way to do that is to not destroy all the oil that you're cycling in your system. Because that, a lot of the oil that's not going into cars goes into products. Almost everything is made from plastic, which is oil-based. Right? And so there is, governments should generally be very positive about uh, uh, increasing the rates of collection and recycling. And they generally are. But there's a funny thing with countries like Germany, but I'm going to pick a different example, say Sweden, which just spent half a billion euro on building an incineration plant. You know what that incineration plant does today? It's crazy. Because it has to keep itself running, and the inbound is variable, you know, one day there's a lot of collection, and the other day maybe less garbage comes in, they buy soda bottles from recycling centers all across Europe, send them up to Sweden to be burned to keep it always having the same amount of kilos going through the incinerator. It's insane. And the big problem with burning is that, you know, when you burn something, it's what you get back is what they call the energy value or the caloric value of the garbage. But the things that, some things burn at negative energy value. If you burn food, you put more energy in than you get out. Okay, so it burns at negative energy. The things that burn at positive energy are the things that are the most recyclable. That's the joke. I don't, it's just, it's crazy. The things that you can get the most value out of, the ones that are the purest plastics, burn at the best energy value. So you have incineration facilities all over the world, including Germany, that are importing recyclable material from recycling centers already sorted out to put in the, in the, in the fire, to keep the fire going. That, I mean, so in the short term, yes, that would be an issue, but it's a fundamental problem. I mean, it's something that we have to, sort of like coal power, uh, sorry, coal power. At some point, we have to stop doing it because it's just not a good idea. It is better than landfilling, but there's many challenges with it. So I don't want to say, like, you know, Germany still has a very advanced uh, waste management system, more advanced than the U.S., more advanced than Canada. But burning isn't the final uh, solution in this case. The final solution is looking at it being as cir circular as possible, and that creates material independence, which governments should be happy about. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom Sackett.